we know that uh, packet, or you, you tell it, you tell me what is packet later after this course, okay? So I, I usually mix around with different terms. Uh, some sometimes I would say application message, some kind I would say that it is a, a transport layer thing or a transport layer uh, message, and then I would say something about packets. Okay, so let's still mix it together. Okay, so let's say there is a packet firing from two different hoses or one host. I don't know which of the scenario. Let's say we focus on the first scenario that both packets fire from the same host. Okay, so that is very easy, right? Uh, after the, after uh, the last Wednesday lecture, there is a, a two, one or two students ask me, hey, why this uh, socket okay, is equal to file descriptor, okay? So you have to recall the example code that I, I give you, okay? What is socket? You call socket, basically it return you a number. And that number is so happened that it's equal to file descriptor, okay? So no matter opening a file or opening a socket, in C, or I, I shouldn't say in C, in the world of Unix and Linux and Mac, they treat it all the same, no matter if it's demo socket, or opening a file. So it is a file descriptor. Or I should say, the file descriptor is corresponding to the connection. Now let's say the connection was already been open. It's already been open. That's why you have something like this, FD, you know, 4, FD, you know, 5. When the two guys get fired from the same machines, so the fate is we want to map a specific thing, specific packets to us to its uh, belonging connections. Okay, never cross it, right? I, I wish that this guy would deliver to here, this guy would deliver to here. I, I will say that for the first round, they have this mapping, and the second round, third one, fourth one, until the end of the connection, the mapping is still the same. So we have to keep up from some rules. Let's say the rules based on the destination port and the source port of the packet that is just sent. And if we follow this, basically we have a quite stable mapping. Okay, what is stable mapping? The mapping is, let's say, I fire a packet from this source port. This is a, a machine, okay, this is a machine, this is another machine, okay? And this machine opening to socket, basically there are two applications. I don't know why these two applications sending messages to the same server, and the same server open to file descriptor, in order to receive that, okay? If you cannot catch this idea, take a look back in the last chapter notes as well as the code, okay? So I will receive it based on, let's say, uh, this, the, the, um, the, 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 the button at the bottom, uh, the port number is 24680, set it from there. Now I know that the packet coming in is using this, uh, this source port. So I directly map it to the application this file descriptor, and usually this file descriptor will map to a particular thread. Okay, let's say I use multi framework This is a one process multi thread It will map to that thread, and that thread will read it, and you won't mix it up, right? So this all happened inside kernel. So no matter you are using a threading, or I don't know what kind of mechanism you are using, this is transparent to you, okay? This kind of conversion is transparent to you, so that when you receive a packet, you don't need to say, oh, I received something, should I remember the source port and remember who I'm talking to? No, you don't need to, okay? It will eventually map to this file descriptor. Now, what is the problem, oh, by the way? This mechanism, we call it the multiplexing, okay? What is uh, the problem is, another problem is, what happens if I have two different clients I don't know why these two different clients using the same source port, okay, by random, okay? I don't know why, they use the same source port. Now, if I follow what I have previously, what I previously say that, if the destination port of the packet is port 88, it will go to this process, but I don't know which thread or which file descriptor you should go to, so then I look up the source port. If it's source port 13579, go to this thread, or this uh, file descriptor, else go to this file descriptor. Now, can we still trust this? I don't think so. You cannot trust this mapping anymore. Because there are chances that, uh, although these two coming from two different hoses, 
you will have a chance that they will use the same source port. Okay? So that means that basically this transport layer is not fairly uh, self-contained. If I only use the port number to differentiate which connection it is, you fail. Okay? So why I say that it's not self-contained, we need as well the IP address. Suppose IP address is uh, what we call the network layer information. Okay, so this is transport layer information, application layer information. I don't care about application layer uh, information because after the transport layer had determined the fate of the packet, this application layer would deliver to the process. So we don't need to take care of it. We only take care of the transport layer. Now what I'm going to tell you that only believing in the data in the, or not believing, we lie. Not only relying on the data in the transport layer fail. Because we will have a chance of both using the same source port. That's why we need one more pair of information which is from the upper layer, the network layer. Okay? So when the entire packet coming in, you are not just taking account into this uh, source port as well as the source IP address to differentiate which machine that packet is coming from. Okay, so this is a new concept. I mean, not a new concept anymore. I mean, uh, every people in, in, in nowadays life already know that I have an IP address. That means that the IP address mapped to my machine. So I look at the source IP address. That means that I want to know which machine I'm using. Okay, so at the end, you will know that this is uh, the whole picture. We need the one, two, two layers of, app, uh, of uh, information in order to perform the demultiplexing. Okay. So what's next? After we know that how to deliver the accurate information to the corresponding thread or corresponding connections, now we look into coding. Okay? Look into coding. So what is this application? Uh, this application I just uh, write it in a very uh, I mean a uh, very lousy way, a high every detail, so I need to tell you what it is. Uh, let's say I dot 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 here because I don't want to tell you whether this is TCP or UDP. Okay, so it means that uh, it is uh, common for both UDP and TCP, okay? And after you set up a socket, I don't know which data you're choosing, let's say UDP or TCP, they will both create a data structure called TCP or UDP control data structure, okay? So UDP control data structure may be more easy because it's don't need to keep track of where the packet is delivered or not, okay? So maybe TCP is better, UTP is smaller. Still, they have two buffers. Okay. Now this is really common to both uh, connections. What is the buffer? One is called receive buffer. Okay. Is to catch data coming from the network. Okay. So why you need to catch it? Is it is a there is a chance that uh that I mean uh, how can I explain to you? Okay. So the kernel is basically working asynchronously with your application, right? Maybe your application, uh, because of scheduler choice, your application cannot get the CPU usage, okay? And the CPU is serving other various other processes. Now, what happened? Packet comes. When a packet comes, what should the kernel do? The kernel will temporarily cache the data inside the receipt buffer. Until when? Until the scheduler choose you to run, and then you can have a chance to read the data from the receipt buffer, okay? So this is for asynchronous um, manipulation. So I should say this is a, a man, I mean a hidden model of the producer consumer, okay? Or in another way around there is a same buffer, okay? Later on I will tell you what is a same buffer. Same buffer is uh, when an uh, application wants to send something, you will write the data to the same buffer, okay? And then the kernel will use the network card to send it by reading from the same buffer. Okay, so this is common for both TCP and UDP. Okay, so what's next? Next is, after I create the socket, basically we have these three guys. Now, what if I'm going to write something? Okay, so you may ask, hey, whether UDP has to connect or not, okay? This is our questions. Later on, I will tell you, yes, UDP and TCP both can call connect. Okay, but it's our question, so I didn't talk about the connect call. Now, let's say after I successfully perform the connect, what should I do? I will first write a 
write a message out, okay? I'm using the application logic, right? This is application logic. The application logic say that I want to write something to the file descriptor from the buffer. Now, what behind the screen is a kernel. The kernel will do something like this. Let's say the message is called hard work. Let's say it's hard work. I will copy the auto buffer content, really copy, copy a piece of user, user space memory to the kernel space memory. Now the kernel has a piece of data of your hello world message now. What should it do? What should it do? I don't know whether you, you, you have the feeling about it or not. Um, let's say in a file, file, okay? You have to write a file, okay? In an operating system course. You will find that when you are writing things, it sends up blocks. Have you ever feel this? Yeah, really a feeling, okay? You read, usually you will sense that ah, it's blocking, okay? Because you read, then you wait for data to come, okay? But you write, you send up blocks, and you send up few the blocks, okay? Usually when you call the write system call, immediately return, okay? Now, what is the be behavior? Why or how can I explain this behavior? Basically, the same buffer do a lot, okay? The same buffer is allows you to copy the things into the kernel, no matter if it's TCP or UDP, okay? Now, after it's recalculated re it, and you find that there are enough space to host this hello world, then it will immediately return. And the kernel will do the things asynchronously for you, okay? So this is what, what we know about the behavior, right? You know that, oh, write is fast, read is slow, and this is why, okay? You just uh, do a memory copy. And that's all, okay? And the kernel will do the asynchronous work. Now what I'm going to discuss next, okay? So I, that's why I said cast this decision. Why does the same buffer become full? Can, can anybody tell me why? Is there any su such a case? I said that uh, the write system code will write something to the same buffer so that the same buffer, if there is a space, it will accommodate the buff the, the user space buffer and then return immediately. Okay? Now what if there is no space? Or I should say why there will be no space? Think about it. If it's a network, okay, if it's a network, I wish to send something else. Is there any reason that stop us? To send anything out, if there are such a chances, that means that I can clean up this buffer. Any idea? Hmm? But we didn't see no connection. No, no connection. Then you cannot create this socket. <laughs> I mean, the connect fail. I should say the connect fail. Okay. If if there is a if you cannot connect, then connect fail and exit one. Any chance, or there is no chance, I just make up a, a dream, okay, just a, a, a false alarm, okay? It won't, nev it never happened. Or you can think of any scenario. Huh? Just use the imagination. You don't need to tell me the reason. Huh? Close, very close. Okay, his answer is, uh, at, at the same time, I send one gigabyte of data out. Okay? Reasonable, right? If you can uh, create a buffer in a, in a data, data segment, okay, the global variable so, okay, I create a one gigabyte buffer and call this. Now, let's say the kernel don't have one gigabyte buffer here. What will happen? Well, have it immediately become full, right? Immediately become full. Now, what's next? Should the system call reject you and say that no, you are sending something too bad? Usually, it's not, right? Usually, it's try hard to serve you. It will try to send something. Let's say the buffer is only one meg, okay? And his request is one gigabyte, okay? One megabyte, one gigabyte. So, what's the ratio? Uh, you just you can say it's one thousand or one zero two five, okay? Let's say this is one thousand. Ratio is one thousand. So then, what will, what will be the system call look like? The system call will be a 
copy one time, send it out, and then another time of one megabyte, send it out, and keep on doing it for 1,000 times, and during that time, the rest system called blocks. Okay, this is called blocks, it means that until it's finished copying all the data, and all the data get flushed out to the network. Okay, so what is that? This is again a producer-consumer model, right? The producer is too, too horrible, and the consumer is too slow. Okay, what, should, what, what will be the problem? The problem is the buffer is always full. Then the producer has to block. Okay, so yeah, the producer-consumer is everywhere. Okay, so don't, don't be afraid, okay? You don't need to write it, it's hidden inside kernel. But you have to understand the behavior. Suddenly you find out oh, why my application is so slow, okay? Or why the, why the rates of sending is not as optimistic as the thing, okay? Maybe this is the reason, okay? Now, what's next? Next is about this sleep and the read call, okay? They come in a pair. I put a sleep call on purpose, okay? So let's say the read system call, I don't need to sleep because sleep, I just call random, okay? Maybe so happen is sleep, sleep zero. So I don't need to sleep anymore. Now what happened here, I want to read uh, how many bytes, 100 bytes into my input buffer. What is, the, what is the purpose? The purpose is to read from the socket, right? I read data from the network, but no data is ready in the receive buffer. So that means what? That means no incoming data before I call read. Okay, now this is a very important point. That means that I can omit read, okay? I can stop calling read, but at the same time, asynchronously, the network has something coming in, and it will be cached here. But it so happens that there's nothing here, so the system call read will be blocked here. We will block here, waiting for network uh, data to come. Now, let's say there's a happy together message coming in. Okay, so what should you what should you do? You are the kernel. You will copy this message to the input buffer. Or oh, by the way, if the input buffer is uh, is uh, not big enough, though you may be there a chance to break this uh, message in two. Okay, so this is the workflow, basic workflow. Now what happened? Oh, by the way, am I going too fast? Yeah, this is not not really a simple concept. Okay. The concept is that there are two guys working in synchronous. One is application, one is curl. And, and, and so there's a, a hidden third guy. Okay, the third guy is is the one sending data in. Okay, so that guy is hidden, not in this picture. Okay, so any questions? So that means So he asked a very good question. Huh? Uh, I send something, okay, so it already go out to the network, but but the the guy making the send or the write system call did not finish all the things of that call, right? And the network suddenly I don't know why fails you. What will happen? What will happen is like that. That depends on whether it is UDP or TCP. If it's UDP, nothing happened. Okay, because UDP only guarantee that the packet leaves my machine. Okay, push it out, push it out, push it out. And nothing happened. If it is TCP reliable data transfer, it will eventually sense that there is a congestion. Because there's no more message coming back telling me that, oh, I received your previous message, please go on. There's no such control message coming in, then eventually the right system call will return minus one. And why does return minus one? Of course, the first the first thing is the write system call has to fill up the send buffer and cause it to block. And while it's blocking, it know that it is, there is a congestion happen. Then return minus one to tell you that the socket dies. Okay. And it's so complicated. What if what if it's like that? What if I, I don't fill up the send buffer? The write call immediately to return. And how can I sense the congestion? then you may need to depend on recall, okay? The recall suddenly find that there's some problem, okay? I should expect something coming in to tell me that the connection is there. But that message never comes. So the recall will suddenly return minus one, okay? So I mean, uh, doing, doing networking is very complicated, okay? Because there's too many cases mixed together. Yes?
a lot of websites. Uh, uh, one gigabyte, and okay. I use the my system call to the size is one gigabyte, mm -hmm. one gigabyte, and then is it is keep uh, so it is keep blocking, pushing things into the buffer, mm -hmm. and then keep keep uh, blocking. And yes. when the buffer has been cleared out, uh, mm -hmm. that means that means something has been sent. Then the yes. Then something has been sent out, but the network suddenly cut down. It was cut, uh, has been cut down. Then the write system call will return the number of bytes. It, it will return. Right, right. So, so it will consider your write system call fail. But but you have something that sent out. I would say that just treat it as transaction. The transaction failed. But, but TCP is it. Right. TCP is by stream. Right, so that, I mean, uh, if you return minus one, so uh, if not return minus one and return something, what does the meaning? There's no meaning, right? The bias. Yeah, let's, let's just try. <laughs> let's try later, okay? I, I run the server, okay? After we receive one megabyte, I receive one, and I have two, two of them apart, and try it. No problem, I have a, I have a small lab in my office. Okay, so any other problem? No? Okay, so maybe you later you will find other problems then you can, uh, we can discuss about this. Uh, this is a very important uh, idea you can to build it in your mind. Everything works asynchronously. Now, let's push it to a limit. What does it mean to push it in the limit? What happens if I just being a jail in the sleep call? Okay, what will happen? Let's say, while I'm sleeping, at the same time, the happy to get a message comes again. Okay? So as I said that, I, I will do asynchronous thing. The kernel will keep the message in the receive buffer to wait for your read, read call. Okay? So what's that mean? The read call doesn't mean that I re retrieve something from the network. Okay? So the true meaning is, I retrieve things from the receive buffer, not from the network. Okay. If the buffer has things, I will immediately pull it out. If the buffer don't have anything, I will wait until the buffer has things. And who push things to the buffer? The kernel. The kernel will help me put things in the buffer. And of course, this buffer will get full. This buffer will get full. Okay. So what will be the control now? Previous case is this guy is full. The same buffer is full. I know what will happen. Why is some called blocks? Okay, now what if this guy is full? Okay, so usually this guy is full usually because you sleep for too long. Let's say you sleep for 60 seconds. And the uh, other end keep pumping in data. Okay, so what will happen? Now just imagination, okay, there is uh, no answer. Okay, the answer, I need to tackle this answer. At least this set of PowerPoint won't, won't give you the answer. We need the next set of PowerPoint. Yes? Zero window, good. Any other idea? He already know the answer. Don't, don't care what his answer. <laughs> he get it correct. Now how about some, some other, use the imagination, how? How? Yeah, let's say I'm pushing you with a lot of homeworks, okay? And your main homework for is full already. What should you say? Stop, right? Or don't, no, 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 stop it. Or I, it's, it's, you want to file a complaint, right? Compare too many homeworks, okay? So, it's a natural control, right? There should be a kind of a feedback control. The feedback control is say that the other end, listen to me, I only have so many space. Don't push too many data in or I will get full, okay? So there is such a control. Later on, we'll talk about it. It's a connection management, okay? Or in another way around, if there is no such connection management, it will be a unreliable data transfer type. This UDP. The PS case is TCP. If it's UDP, what will happen? Very interesting. You will lose data. You will definitely lose data. I I later on have, can can show you a graph. Okay? My experiment is doing something like this. I have a server, I have a client. The server and client program both in my local host. So local host never miss any data, right? There is no, no network medium okay, for me to lose data. But I use UDP. 
and the sender using a sending rate, greater than the receiver receiving rate. Then you will see data keep losing. Keep losing, losing very fast. Okay? Later on I can show you the graph. The graph is a, I, 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 I can't remember where I put it in. Okay? Because it's supposed to be a supposed to be a, a, a owner section, okay? The, the elite version of 4430, okay? I, I never find out the, where, where I put the elite version material. Okay? So very interesting graph. You can see the wow, what happened? Okay. So next. Uh, any questions? Okay, you will lost thing. Okay, if you are without the connection control, UDP, UDP will lost thing. TCP never. It will manage well. It's telling me other end that stop. Okay. So uh, uh, this is a summary of what I just have said. Okay, what I've just said is the right system calls seven blocks. Okay, seldom means not never. Right. So this is a. Uh, uh, summary for UDP, yes, it's the truth. It never blocks basically. It try to push as many data as I it's one. Okay, seldom blocks mean maybe sometimes block for a while. Okay, but for TCP, the delivery is guaranteed. So the guarantee means that I will manage well. If you are pushing data too fast, okay, you will receive the blocks from the right system call, a right system call. I mean, okay, it will also be a we are, I mean, uh, usually when you're pushing something too fast, okay, you're pushing something too fast, it means that the other end cannot process it so, so quickly. It is also the same, I mean, uh, how can I explain to you? It is a kind of a synchronization method, okay? Let's say your processing rate is uh, one, one megabyte per second, processing rate is one megabyte per second, but my sending rate is one gigabyte per second. Okay, you have to slow down so as to cope with the one megabyte per second processing speed. So it will eventually synchronize the two speed. Okay, by using the block. Okay, later on you will you will see what I'm saying in a in the last part of this chapter three. Okay, so this chapter three I will say that is marvelous. Okay, you will understand everything about the uh, TCP UDP why they can synchronize things why they can uh, even control how fair two user is using the uh, data okay so uh, this is only a, a summary of what I said I want to skip it okay so let's go to UDP UDP I love it okay very easy to teach okay and very easy to write you don't need to set up any connections okay it treat every message as a as a message the message before me doesn't, it doesn't care what it just said, okay? There is no connection idea. So what is the meaning of connection idea? I send a first byte as a, I send a second byte. I don't want the two bytes to flip, okay? But if it is UDP, I send up the first message and send out the second message, okay? The two messages may be delivered in an out of order manner, okay? So, and this is side effects of a no guarantee of the segment delivery. Okay, no guarantee. I, I I really, really mean it. Okay, and segment will loss no matter the medium is. I say that even in local host, the sender and the server uh, and the client and the server both in the local host also have a data loss. Okay, corrupted segment. Okay, the segment may be corrupt. What is the meaning of corrupt? Usually, corrupt means a flip flipping. What is the meaning of flip flipping? How many C is still in here? And it's uh, only a few, right? And uh, one, no, no other C students. Okay. So what is the mean of blip flipping? Uh, blip flipping means that the signal is not strong enough that you cannot detect whether this is a one or zero. Okay. And why there is a no, such a thing that the signal is not strong enough so that you cannot detect the S change, S change. Okay. So maybe there is a background noise to cancel your original signal. So if it is corrupt, that means that some bits. Originally to be zero, become one, or originally become one, it becomes zero. Okay, so we we kind of uh, want to not accept it, but want to correct this. And also connectionness means that I don't need to co-connect. Later on, uh, I, I will ask the TA to set up some uh, example for you. Okay, so out of order. Out of order means that uh, the first idea is very hard to understand. Okay, what is the meaning of hard to understand? You, you have to treat the internet as a black box, 
Okay, so with a black box, you already know that or see figures that the, the internet is a graph. Okay, but I will say that this is a black box. What is that? Maybe even inside a router, okay, they will flip some some messages. Okay, originally we have message one come with paramount after the message. Uh, I mean, uh, I should say that it is I minus one. Okay, and then I and then I plus one, so and so forth. Maybe within the router itself, it's already flipped the order. Okay, so you cannot trust the tree structure. You you may ask, hey, you know, the tree structure or the graph structure, you fill the mi minimum spanning field for the graph, then how can we have different paths? Okay, maybe it's not because of different paths, but inside the router, it's just switch the order. Okay, so I will say that the intermediate device may not behave FIFO. Okay, so that creates troubles. And in TCP, we use one technique to tackle it. We call it sequence number. We add every packet has a number. Uh, this is packet number one, this is packet number two, packet number three, okay? So that when I do, we see packet number two, but without packet number one, I know something wrong. I need to wait for packet number one, okay? So if uh, this is a UDP, okay? Uh, loss is a guarantee, okay? Very interesting. Uh, corrupt packet also happen in uh, both TCP and UDP, and I will use UDP as a as an example to tell you how to correct it. Okay, so I I can skip this just for you to uh, to uh, revise what is this connectionness. Okay, for programming, if you want to write a write a program, the socket field here will be changed to sock dgram. Dgram is datagram. So UDP, okay, U the UDP, the D means datagram, okay? Use the datagram protocol, so UDP. And we will not use read and write system call, okay? We will use the system call called send to. Okay, look at the send to. Look at the send to. The send to, well, what, what is shaking, huh? Any problem, huh? No problem here, okay, the problem there. Okay, so uh, the same to system call is basically I uh, ask for some other things than the buffer, than the length of the buffer and the socket. It has socket, it has the buffer, it has the length of buffer as well. But what are the other fields here? We call it destination info. So that means what? That means you don't basically need to uh, set up connection. You open the socket and say that I want to deliver this message to a specific host. That's all. Okay. So tell you a little secret. Uh, during my time, okay, I was an undergrad. Okay, I take the multimedia course. How many of you are taking it now? Okay. So just only a few. Okay. So I just basically use UDP to do the broadcasting. Yeah. Don't need to use TCP, right? I just use UDP. Oh, this server need this this chunk of the of the wave file give it to you. Okay, and then immediately I use the for loop, okay? basically loop through different machines. Okay, and another machine, all oh, this this trunk, I give it to you, I give it to you. So I don't need to maintain connections. I just use this field, changing this field in a in a round robin manner. Okay, and then I can send to different holes very conveniently. Ah, and the reverse is receive from. Receive from is interesting, huh? You. Don't listen to the socket. There is no listen call. But you call it, and what is the call? The call is to look in the receive buffer, whether the receive buffer has any packets coming in already. If yes, I'll pull it out and also retrieve the sender information for you. Okay? So that means that within the program, you don't need to set up threads. No need for threading. You just keep on calling or oh, send to, send to, receive from, receive from. Then you can uh, loop through different uh, connections eff effectively. But remember, this will block. This will block, okay? So if you, if you already know that oh, there is no, no chance for it to block, then you don't need threat, okay? If you know that there is a chance for fog, uh, for block, not for fog, block, then you will need to uh, have threats. Okay, any questions? Any questions? If no, then I will look into how UDP cor deal with corrupted data. Okay, so UDP 
handle the calculator is very uh, standard. So what is the standard way? It's a generic checksum. Checksum. How many of you have heard of MD5? Only a few. Only a few. SHA, SHA series. One, two, three, four. OK. So this is a what we call cryptographic checksum. It generate, it, it receives the, the data strung from the universe. OK, I don't know what is the size, what is the content, so I said from the universe. And generate a fixed width checksum. And this checksum is the same. OK, but this checksum is much, much weaker. So what is the meaning of much, much weaker? It don't want to uniquely determine a, data, a piece of data. OK, cryptographic checksum like MD5 and SHA1 wish to fulfill a goal. If these two pieces of data are different, okay, then you will have a very, very small probability that these two guys generate the same checksum. And this algorithm okay, is doing something even very weak. Okay, if two data look different, they will have a quite a high chance to generate a checksum which is the same, okay? So what is the purpose? It seems that like it's useless, okay? The purpose is to only cross behavior, and this behavior is because of that, okay? We want to detect blip flip only, okay? When a blip is flip, we know that, okay? But what if, if a bias is a flip, okay? And seldom have a bias flip, okay? X bit here, X bit here, and then flip like this. It's very seldom, right? How can you do this? Uh, how can you how can you use a MATLAB, okay, and stay close to my computer and construct this kind of a flip flip? No, of course. But you use a MATLAB and stay close with my computer, you may flip one to two bits, okay. So this checksum algorithm is to do this. So you can see this the checksum algorithm will generate a very small fixed size checksum of only sixteen bits. Later on, you will say it's sixteen bits only. 16 bits is to the power 16 variations. And the algorithm is very simple. Okay, so what is the algorithm? The algorithm will take into the account the transport layer header. I don't write down what are the fields, okay, because they are not of uh, importance. The only field of importance is here, the original checksum value. Okay, we have to give this initial checksum value to some numbers, okay, we cannot give a random number. So we fix it to be zero, and it go through a checksum algorithm, and put this red guy, the checksum guy, into this field. Okay? So, then I set it out, oh, of course, this checksum algorithm will do the checksum of the header together with the message. Together, okay? So that means that if the brief flip happen in the message, we know. If the brief flip happen in the header, we also know. Okay, if I don't check some header, it's useless. Okay, it's useless. And then I set it here, and I receive a checksum. I don't use the same color because I don't know which this checksum is trustworthy or not, right? Also, this message is the message X. I don't know where the message X is A. Okay, because it's maybe have a flip flip. So then I will extract extract the checksum out, and we set it to zero. And we compute the entire guy using the same checksum algorithm and see whether this blue checksum guy is equal to the red checksum guy. Or I should say, after I compute this, if this guy is this guy, that's okay. Now, let's take a look at the checksum algorithm and we have a break. Okay, so this is the only the properties I will skip it. What is checksum algorithm? Wow, very quick, huh? I give you the entire brick period to take a look at it, okay? Tell me what, what it's about, okay? It is doing, okay, now first of all, I, I, have a, I have an array here, okay? So I treat this as an array. An array of unsigned shot. What is the length of unsigned shot? How many bytes? Two, right? Two bytes. But does it, does it matter whether it's two bytes or one byte? If it is a pointer, it doesn't matter. I don't, I, what I know is the piece of memory, okay? But I use the unsigned shot pointer, okay? 
and the length is to describe how many bytes it has. How many bytes it has. Okay? Then it goes through the first loop pair. The first loop. And take a look at what is the type of the W pointer. It's the same as the input parameter. The type, are they the same? Yeah, the same. Okay? So that means that I don't want to destroy the buff, okay? I just uh, use a W to replace a buff. And then I use W to do something interesting. Take a look what it is doing in the main loop, okay? And tell me what is the output after the main loop. And the output, I mean that the sum variable. And what if, what if the number of bytes is odd number? What if the number of bytes is even number? Will, will it receive different treatment? And the last guy, the last guy is very, very interesting. Yeah? Okay? Take a look for a while, okay? I will stop recording.